Julia Tabavani is a very good and longtime friend of Most Powerful Women. The flagship summit, which we started in 1999, um, you have come to at least, a do I would say, a dozen of those. And you me. and I met in, I think it was maybe 1999. So Juliet is a former headhunter who came to Kleiner Perkins in 2000? 2001. 2001. 2001. So one of the reasons we wanted to have Juliet here is that she has witnessed um, the birth of industries and has witnessed, um, you know, has had a front row seat to uh, some of the great uh, growth of companies and industries, and also something that we're going to touch on is the gender discrimination issue, which you've had a, a front row seat toward uh, at. But first of all, I'd like to ask you, Juliet, since you're Kleiner Perkins sort of talent expert, how do you assess talent and what questions do you ask mm -hmm. people? Um, as you mentioned, Patty, I've been privileged to do what I love for the last 20 years, and my passion has always been people, and that journey started in the world of executive search, having a seat, I'm going to sound very old, in the 1.0 generation of internet company formation, um, recruiting Meg Whitman to eBay, Dan Shulman to Priceline. It was such an exciting and heady time when we met, and so... Um, as I think now of my 16 years at Kleiner Perkins, thinking every day through the lens of people, whether it's the founders that we're backing, how the companies are growing and scaling the new markets we need to be getting in, it's all about people, that's our currency. And so in terms of people assessment, um, I would say that every situation is very stage specific because if you look at venture capital dollars, it's high risk capital and these are high risk hires. And um, typically when we get involved, it's supporting the founder in whatever role that is. And so I was given a very good lesson by Sergey Brin at the beginning of my time at Kleiner because we were recruiting the first CFO for Google. and. Um, I said to him, well, of course we need someone who has a background as a controller and treasury in anticipation of where the company's gonna go long term. And he said to me, well, why can't we hire just a brilliant PhD who understands Quicken? <laughs> and I looked at him with all my swagger of being 28 at the time, but it stopped me in my tracks because I realized the brilliance of Sergey in many areas, but is also to look at a position and a role with a new light and a new lens. And if you look at how the business functions at Google have evolved, they bring that business lens and they bring that technical lens, they bring that data lens to everything they do. And so I'm always mindful as you assess talent, you have to be situation specific. You have to also recognize how roles and positions evolve. And then you have to look very distinctly at the culture and the value set of the team around which you're building. Because if you don't get that right, it's gonna be a disaster. Um, if I look at the people who have really shone through my 16-year journey, I come back to a gentleman, um, Omid Kordestani, who was the first business hire at Google. I had nothing to do with his hire, but I did have a privilege of working with him as he built his team. And um, two years ago, he had retired from Google, serving on a number of boards. Um, we were talking about his next chapter, and he said, I just have a passion for great founders. And I introduced him to Jack Dorsey, and um, he's the executive chairman at Twitter, and he loves working with Jack. And so the assessment piece of being able to look at a person, look at what they're going to bring, hiring to your strengths is also very critical. And um, hiring to your strengths. Completely. Um, looking at an organization saying, what is that company going to need three, four years from now? And can we ensure that that hire is going to bring the strengths today, but also can scale going forward? An example you know, of that, again, very early in my career at Kleiner Perkins, um, we were involved in helping Jeff Bezos think about his leadership team. He had just made a decision to depart from his COO, who he had hired. He wanted to have a functionally strong team. And um, we recruited Tom Skutak from GE. It was a very tough search, GE, for any GE people in the audience. GE turned him around, made a very competitive bid to keep him, but we won. And um, 
and um, 16 years you know, into his time, he, he was the CFO of Amazon for 16 years. What did he bring? He brought operational discipline. He brought a relentless focus on margin. He brought global expansion, and he brought scale to be able to have that trajectory to take Amazon and partner with Jeff over a 16-year career it was just extraordinary. So um, those are some of the things that we, I look to. So where have you failed in your assessment of people? Give us an example. Well, you know, I would say I sort of try and learn from every situation that I'm in. Um, having done this for a long time and having had the opportunity to work with extraordinary people, I've been fortunate that I haven't have ever made a hire who is just bad and incompetent, but there are hires that don't fit the situation at hand, and that's the precarious nature of venture capital. You know, where is the company in its product development cycle? Where is it in its revenue cycle? Where is it in its funding cycle? Occasionally, you do get it wrong that you can bring in someone who may be too big company. We talk about that all the time, you know, that it's trying to move a company too fast. Um, Cultural, you know, we always talk about organ rejection is really important. You know, someone who can really connect with the founding team, with the founding culture, that's when you get it wrong. But, you know, I'm too old and, you know, hopefully have enough great people around me. We really try and make sure that those situations don't happen as frequently. So, Kleiner Perkins has a, certainly has a storied history in the creation of company, you know, some of the greatest global companies. Um, Kleiner Perkins was very, very early to Google and Amazon. The, the firm was late to, very late to Facebook. I think you invested mm -hmm. in Facebook at a $52 billion valuation, which seems like peanuts to what Facebook is today. Um, you were late to Twitter. Um, what are the lessons in terms of, either from a talent perspective or a broader perspective, what has Kleiner Perkins learned about making the right bets at the right time? Mm, that's a very big question, and I would say we're still learning, and um, thank you, Patty, for reminding me that we cannot afford to be late. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, a couple of things. Generational transition in partnerships is hard, and, you know, I really work hard at that um, every day, as do my partners, but, you know, if you think about, I mean, venture capital is a really challenging profession to get right all the time. And to be able to have the balance of a, a firm that's evolving, an industry that's moving very quickly, our industry is highly competitive. If you look, last year there were about $50 billion of capital that came into venture, about $27 billion of angel financing, plus the growth, the tremendous growth of Chinese capital infusion into the United States. This is a big industry. It is not the industry that I came into 16 years ago, the pace of change, the pace of innovation. And so you've got to get a lot of things right. Um, at any one point in time. But what we do, um, and we do um, every day, is to try and make sure that we build the best leaders in our firm, we support the best entrepreneurs, and we also embolden them with confidence. Yes, we've missed areas, but you know, our limited partners pay us to take risk. We're not gonna get it right all the time. We jumped into green tech, we still would have jumped into green tech. Out of that came a seed investment in Nest. So you can't get everything right all the time, but we work really hard to try and make sure we learn from our mistakes and we don't choke up on the bat. Always dangerous when I use an American sports analogy. <laughs> You've been here long enough that you I have. Do and that I have a Julia. 10 year old son who teaches me now about baseball. <laughs> uh, who has a question? Yes, over here. Please identify yourself. Hi, I'm Melody Hildebrandt at Fox. Recently left Silicon Valley after seven years. Um, rather pleased to do so at the time. And I, I wonder what you make of the decency pledge um, and your response to, to that as being an effective or ineffective call to action. I admire um, the people that have come together around the decency pledge. Um, 
But let me pause and say, this is about a bigger issue, as I think we all agree. And so these are very important steps into an overall environment, which is to create an environment um, that absolutely supports and advances diversity and creates safe and respectful working environments. Um, and I think we're all really committed to doing more about that. So this is a great step in the right direction, and we have to do more. Two years ago when Ellen Powell um, sued Kleiner Perkins, um, Juliet, you testified at that, at that trial. Kleiner Perkins won. Um, how, do you, how do you look at that ordeal that Kleiner Perkins went through, which brought the world's attention to discrimination in Silicon Valley? So I don't really want to focus on the Ellen Powell trial. That was a case that was tried, heard, and decided upon. But what I do want to do is to look forward. Um, and we're at a really important moment in time right now um, with th the media attention. You know, we're sitting here in California, everything that's coming out of Hollywood, and this call to action to say, um, we have to do more to support women. We have to do more to support diversity. It's good for business to have a diverse company. I have one of my most favorite companies in Europe, in Berlin, is a company called Go Euro. 50% of their engineers are women. 50% of their workforce is women. The founder, Narim Sham, built that company like that from day one. He, to me, is my shining example of how to do it right. And is Kleiner Perkins an investor we in are. that company? We are, and he gets an unfair share of my time because I am so passionate about what he is building, and I hope we can have many more situations like that. Yes, over here. Uh-huh. Uh, Jillian Hellman with Realty Mogul. I'm interested in knowing thematically where you're personally interested in investing or where the firm's interested in investing, and more specifically in, in blockchain or cryptocurrency, and if you're making bets there. So um, we invest across the broad sector of tech and obviously life sciences and biotech. We are always looking at these new and emerging markets that falls into the fintech area. Um, so yes, we thematically look at all those areas. We also, you know, are watching um, cryptocurrency very closely. And you know, I'll leave it at that. Just given that some investment decisions have yet to be announced. So Juliet reminded me backstage, actually told me, I confess I did not know this, that today is type one diabetes day. Yes, it is. And you have a very personal connection to that. I'd like you to explain that, Juliet. And you do use your power beyond your platform, which, which is what I believe we all should be doing. So tell us about that. So, um, Five years ago, um, in my Annus Horribilis, I uh, finalized a divorce and my son was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes within about three months. And it was one of those sort of completely, f oh, and I think I ended up in the ICU uh, for nine days with bilateral pneumonia. So ladies, take care of your health, it's really important. Um, and so that was my sort of year of feeling incredible vulnerability. And, um, once I'd sort of come up for air, um, I decided that I had to take the lessons from a wonderful experience that I had had, which was being on the board, I still am today, of Product Red with Bono and Bobby Shriver, and help to take the lessons and the skills that I had learned from that incredible experience and to put it into the world of type 1 diabetes. Raise your hand if you know what type 1 diabetes is. Oh, good. I love the next-gen audience. So many people don't. I didn't know when my son was diagnosed. It's a horrible autoimmune decision. It requires incredible management. And um, it's one of the orphan diseases that doesn't get a lot of dollars behind it. And so my lessons from Red, where you have to brand something before you can raise money. Um, we've developed incredible branding for a foundation that we started called Beyond Type 1. I needed someone with a megaphone, a celebrity, to amplify it. And Nick Jonas, who is half my age and still occasionally hangs out with me, um, 
<laughs> is our celebrity. And um, we have in the two years, thanks to the incredible leadership of this foundation, become the largest Taiwan community online. We have 1.5 million followers on Facebook. We've raised millions of dollars to find a cure. We're going to be announcing some very big initiatives. And today happens to be Type 1 Day. So thank you for giving me an opportunity to just highlight that because what I've been able to do through my lessons at Kleiner Perkins and my experience is to do some really interesting things in philanthropy, which... Beats well, us. You've, you've been involved in building many startups, and you have built this startup, and you helped build build red, so that's fantastic. And Juliet, thank you very much. Thank you for having me.